Now you know. Hallelujah. I love that. Now you know. And we live it out. We walk it out. Go now to the next passage in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And this is also a very personal, very practical, very beautiful part of what you're doing today, what you're living out every day, and what you have an opportunity to live out when you get up in the morning, when you walk along the way, when you come home in the afternoons. And we're going to talk about that a lot in a bit. And this one says, for we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Another passage says we're God's masterpiece. I like that too. But the word workmanship is the Greek word poemia, from which we get our English word poem. Okay, God created your life in such a beautiful, powerful way. And then he did something before this world was even formed. Okay, And that is he created good things for you to do. Good works. Look at this. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you realize that this morning and tomorrow, God has already prepared works for you to live in, walk in, do, and accomplish? Oh, yeah. That's his plan. Okay? And he has already provided everything you need now, again, you're going to know this, and so now we make a choice. And the choice is, do we walk in them, do we do them, or do we not? Do we even recognize that they're presented before us for us to live them out? Oh, hallelujah. Last week, I started talking to you about the family relationship of the husband. And then uh, now, in extension to that message, uh, the successful father. And that's what I want to speak to you about today. Uh, the secret, if you want to call it that, to being a successful father. And I want to give you this thought first because there is a tendency in our lives to hear a message that, that kind of sets forth God's ideal or God's design and God's plan. And then we measure that plan and that ideal against our own lives because this is not just a message to the fathers although this is the main focus but it is to each one of us who are called children of God and it is applicable to every one of our lives and it may not be applicable specifically in this area at this moment in your life but God has a plan and a purpose for you to receive this word so today before we move any further I was praying and I was worshiping and I was thanking the Lord I was glad to see Diana was able to make it she was not able to be here at the Spanish service for a very, um, very distinctive reason, okay? Uh, we had a, a challenging weekend, starting with Thursday night. We came in, and we did some work here at the church, and we spent a good three hours doing it. And it was one of these physical exertion type of, of activities that we did. And so at the end, we were just so grateful to go and lie down and go to sleep. And the bed, you know how it is when the bed just feels so comfortable? And you say, oh, thank God for this bed. Hallelujah. This is the life, another brother says. And, and of course, just as we had fallen asleep, not, I'm not kidding you, 15, 20 minutes later, the phone rings. And it's my younger brother. My younger brother lives with my mom, okay? And um, my mom is 99 years of age. I've told you this before. She's 99. She will, by God's grace, and she's so strong physically. Thank God for that. We're expecting that in April of next year, she celebrates her 100th birthday, okay? And so, it's my brother, and he doesn't call at that time of the night. So, immediately, you know, all of your, um, what happened when mom fell and mom hurt herself. And I could hear her moaning in pain in the background. And, and, and immediately, my wife and I got dressed, and we ran. We just ran to the car. We drove uh, to Lozano. Lozano is uh, 20 minutes away. And uh, by then, he had also notified my sister. My sister lives across the street. And she had hurt herself really badly. So it was an ER moment. We took her to the ER. And uh, my wife was with her all night long at the ER. And then the next day, you know how it is at the ER, you know? You're, you're just there, and you're just waiting for them to do something and talk to you and come and do, run tests and give you the result of the tests. And, well, the end result was she... She needed six staples on her head. 
suture on her forehead. Uh, she looks like she's, you know, been in a fight with Rocky. You know, her eyes are bloodshot, bodhicitta. And she was in a lot of pain. And uh, so we had a, a, a difficult weekend. My wife and I spent the night with her on Friday night. We spent the night last night. And, uh, but by, by God's grace, um, the CAT scan came back okay. It broken nose, yes, but other than that, no bleeders, thank God. And for a lady of her age, you know, you're, you're concerned. We're always concerned. And, um, and so now she needs really uh, round-the-clock vigilance. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And when she got home on Saturday, um, Friday evening, she was wobbly. Of course, wouldn't you be? You know, it was, it was a rough time. Um, I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because um, my wife wasn't here. In, in, I need you to, I'll ask you to pray for her when you remember, my mom, that the, the healing will continue and she'll be able to res restore her strength and health. And for us, too. Because um, whenever you're thrown for a loop like that, and, you know, things become a little different. You, you have to adjust. And, um, but we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay, Th those, are, those are moments where you don't even recognize that they're good works, but you go and you, you just respond. And, and there, um, now my sister and my wife and myself and my other sister and my brother, and not my younger brother, but my other brother, are taking turns and watching her, making sure that she doesn't get up too wobbly. Um, and, and as a source of praise, um, anybody, and I know you're, everybody's going to raise their hand at this because you're all very familiar with it. Anybody heard of Molly D's polka party? <laughs> yeah, neither had I. Um, I say that because in a moment I'm going to talk about fathers, okay, but... I'm grateful to God for Molly D's polka party. What is that, Pastor? RFD TV. Okay, RFD TV. Everybody tunes in every day to RFD TV. Rural, get this, rural farm district television. It's, uh, it, it is a thing. And, it, and it's on uh, direct TV, and it's from Minnesota, Michigan, one of those northern Texas counties that this particular, <laughs> I snuck that in they, what they do is this one lady, she has these bands, these German polka bands. Accordion, the bass fiddle, trumpets, and saxophone, exactly. And <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing, you know, the, the polka. And, and so, but, but they're wearing German lederhosen, you know, those little uh, pants, half... Um, what are they called over there? Uh, it's, it's the overalls. The overalls, but they're only like to hear. Anyway, I'm giving you much too much detail than you need to know. Here's what happened. My brother turned it on, and he turns it on often, okay? I didn't know that because <laughs> it only comes in the evening. And mom, this was yesterday, she started watching it, and she enjoyed it. And she said, mira, mira como andan bailando. Mira nomás. And then my wife, you know, she's an instigator. She says, ¿Quiere bailar? <laughs> my mom has just had trauma to the skull, okay? And she, her, her balance was wobbly, but now her balance was good. And she gets up and she says, ¿Pues vamos? So she says, I'm not kidding you. There's a picture or two somewhere. And so she says, go on, let me take a picture. <laughs> so there I am. With my 99-year-old mom, you know, dancing in the spirit. <laughs> my first thought was, hey, I'm a pastor. No, I'm a son. And I got a 99-year-old nine, mama um, who was <laughs> dancing to polka music. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I praise you for this. <laughs> I was telling Caleb yesterday, he was cutting the grass in the back. And I, and I was telling him about the, the trauma, not about the dancing, but about the trauma. And I said, thank God that it has been said that hard-headedness runs in our family. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> Double entendre. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. I did not expect to be laughing in today's service, to be honest with you. But the God that we serve is a God of grace and a God of healing and a God of power 
and a God that we should worship and that we do in, in faith. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's, let's get to the message, huh? Can we do that? Praise God. The Father's place. The next slide. The Father's place in the home. And, and always our launching point of any message has to be, if we're going to get anywhere and receive anything, is, is in the Word of God. So that, that's our launching point for today. It's God's Word. And look at what it says in John 10, 35 about God's Word. If he called them gods to whom the Word of God was given, and look at this, and the Scriptures cannot be broken. Remember I told you about facts? The words that I'm going to share with you that you're going to read, that you're, that you're going to hear me speak, are words that are unbreakable. They are holy. They are right. They are God himself speaking to us because he's the only one that has the right design for marriage, for marriage relationships, for fatherhood, for husbands. Amen. Amen. And so let's look at, let's start our, 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 um, our message today by looking at what God says we should do with this word, this unbreakable word. Amen. In Joshua chapter 1. Verse 8, the Word of God says, This book of the law, meaning the Word of God, meaning the Old Testament, now it includes the New Testament, the entirety of God's revealed Word. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, then, when you... Speak the word of God when you meditate on the word of God, when you do the word of God, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. And then he says, verse nine, have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord your God, the creator of heaven and earth is present with you, will be present with you. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be discouraged because his word is in you. His word is now coming now alive in you. And he says, and God is with you. The Lord your God. So don't be worried. Don't be dismayed. In, in this passage, in, in this message today, where it says here, read the word, meditate on the word, live out the word, depend on God's presence, do it, receive it. It's truth. It's a fact. Let that fact be received by your heart, by your mind, and let that fact increase your faith. Like I said at the beginning, put your emotions aside. Put your, put your feelings aside. And I say, well, you might say, well, Pastor, that's easy to do. Guys, yesterday, Saturdays are my day, eight hours, ten hours a day on Saturdays, that, that I just relax. I just spend time with the Lord, prepping, trying to do the best I can to receive you know, His Word. I've been praying during the week. My wife and I have been discussing and thinking and praying and receiving. And then it's, it's kind of like putting it together, okay? Well, I, no, I didn't have those. I didn't have the luxury of that. Uh, and so I spent the time in Lozano in the evening. Uh, and we did. And, we, and there I just set myself aside. Very sketchy internet in Lozano. Uh, but, but the Spirit of God was giving me word and, and encouraging me and reminding me, listen, um, you are God's workmanship. You're created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. And so do you think that God knew before this world was formed that that was going to happen? Yeah. Do you think that God knew the opportunity was there to serve her or just leave her in a in the hospital until whenever they found a bed, they never did find a bed for her. So there in those moments, you, you wonder, is, is God's word that practical and that real? Yes, it is, and even more so. Because these words that I'm going to share with you now, the, the, the reality is that God has prepared good works for each one of us. And they become so clear when we just give it some thought. They become so real. And I'm going to share a few examples in a moment, but let's go on because... In regarding the, the, the husband, the father now, God's plan for marriage is to bring the woman and the man to the fullness of their God-given potential. Why? 
to raise godly offspring. To raise godly offspring. God's purpose is for you to, keep, to be married, to love each other, that you would have fruit to him. And that's children that love God. Children that, that look to God first. Children that when there is a problem in the home, know where to go to find the solution. Children that, as Pastor Frank, he, he was so eloquently putting it a moment ago, you know, God has prepared all of these things for us to work in, and we don't know the end result. But God knows. God knows two generations down the road, three or four, if Jesus tarries. God knows what your great-great-grandchildren are going to need at that particular instance, that he's already given you an opportunity to plant that seed now, to live that word now, to, to love that unlovable person now so that the way for that child of yours, that grandchild, that great-grandchild of yours will be open and f God's favor will be manifested in their lives. So, first of all, I want us to look at Ephesians 5.25 where it tells us, husbands, how we, we are to, to love our wives, okay? And it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. How Christ, you notice it doesn't say how Jesus. Jesus was his given name. Christ was his anointed title as the anointed one, the Messiah. Anointing, remember, is, is that act of pouring oil on, right? The anointing is, is the the power of the Holy Spirit manifested through oil. Here um, at the end of the service, um, I'm going to call the people up for prayer, all of you. Okay, If you want prayer, we're going we're gonna to anoint you with oil according to the book of James. And But we're not going to do it like they used to in the Old Testament, in the old days. Back then, the anointing was the actual point. You remember that scene where Jesus is anointed with oil by the, the, the woman that comes in, breasts, breaks the flask, pours out the alabaster uh, uh, flask, pours out the oil upon Jesus, and it just goes down. His, it saturates his head, his face, his body. Okay. Well, that's how they would anoint back then. It wasn't the simple little dab on the forehead. Okay. But the anointing was for service, to be able to, to minister the way that you're called. And, and there was three areas where the anointing was used. It was used for those who were prophets. The prophets were anointed by God. The priests were anointed by God. The kings were anointed by God. Okay? And Jesus Christ fulfilled to the fullest each one of those three roles. So if I'm, I'm going to ask myself, okay, how did Jesus love the church? How did Christ, excuse me, love the church? How did the anointed one love the church? That's the way I'm supposed to. Serve, love my wife, and by extension, my family. Okay? So the three roles that Jesus fulfilled are the same ones, believe it or not, that God calls us as fathers to do and to fulfill. The first one is prophet. What would the prophet do? You remember, have you read any of the Old Testament prophets? There's two words, two phrases that always are there. The first one is, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, to Ezekiel, etc. Okay? And then once the word of the Lord came to them, then what? They would stand up and they would say, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Okay? So Jesus Christ fulfilled that in what way? John chapter 1 verse in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the incarnate, the living Word of God. So as a prophet, he received God's revelation, and he delivered God's re revelation to us, to the people. He was also not only the prophet, but he was also the priest. What does the priest do? Well, the priest has this wonderful role to, to play. The priest intercedes for the people. He prays for the people. He represents God to the people and says, look at, look at your God. And then he, look, he represents the people to God and says, God, look your people. Okay? And so when he does this, 
It's for loving. It's for ministering to. It's for healing. It's for every need to be met. That's, that's the priestly role. How did Jesus himself fulfill that? Jesus is the high priest of our confession. Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice so that all of the benefits that he deserved were poured out upon us and all of the punishment that we deserved was placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross. The priest, he healed the people. The people would come to him. He would heal them. And the Bible says that not only did he do that during the lifetime here, but now Jesus Christ ever lives to intercede for us. One time one, one person told me, oh, it's been a long time since somebody prayed for me. And I said, no, no. Jesus is praying for you every single day. He's interceding for you always. And the third is king. We believe Jesus is king. Amen. We believe he is the coming king soon. Hallelujah. That's him. He's the one who rules. He's the one who reigns. But we're used to a king sitting on a throne. Big to do, big, you know, um, to do that's being, okay, look, we're going to coronate him on such and such a day. And he's going to live in luxury. And he's going to have all his needs met. And Jesus says, no, that's not the kind of king I'm talking about. Because I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And in the most beautiful way, he says, this is how I want you guys to be kings. I want you to rule this way. And he takes this towel, and he takes a basin, and fills it with water. And then he washes the dirty feet of his disciples. So that's Jesus, okay? That's the way Jesus fulfilled, in, in summary, the roles of the prophet, the priest, and the king. Now, what about men? What are we supposed to do? Look, look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, okay? Verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, verse 5. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Sorry, Allison, I didn't give me enough time to, to pull that up. There it is. He found it. Hallelujah. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. I have to remember what my wife asked me to do, and that is slow down. Uh, Pastor Frank, Brother Rudy, David, we need to slow down. Okay, when we ask the folks, hey, I want you to read, uh, you know, Isaiah 53, and then we go right into it. Uh, but we need, to, we need to have this word in our hearts and minds. And, and if I rush through it, that is lacking. So this verse, remember, this is the first commandment. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And from that love that we receive, then life pours into us. These words, he says, which I command you today shall be in your heart. And then, and guess who he's talking to? He's talking to the fathers. He's talking to the men. He says, and you, fathers, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. The responsibility for training our children in the way we should go is mom and dad, but mainly it's dad, mainly it's father. We're, we have the responsibility to teach our kids the word of God, to be the prophets of the home, to go to the Lord and receive, thus says the Lord. And then to come to our children, come to our family and says, I'm sorry, the word of the Lord will come to me. And then you say, thus says the Lord to our family. This is, this is the design of God. And God's design is perfect and precious. We're supposed to, to read the Bible. Why do I tell you read the Bible? Why do I tell you spend time, make it a priority? Why do I say this until you say, I, okay, I get it, I get it. Well, I'm going to keep saying it until we not only get it, but do it. Amen? And when, you know what, and this is something that I deal with myself. I, have, I was telling one, one particular gentleman, I said, listen, this, is, this happened. You know, and as a result of this happening, um, I, I was up till two or three in the morning. But in the morning, my choice was, well, I need to sleep in. No, I need to hear from God. And so I got up that morning, despite the fact that it was a difficult morning. Got up and read my proverb for the day. Then I presented my day to the Lord, presented my family, presented my children, my wife to the Lord, and especially my mom. Let me tell you one other thing. 
Whenever you're faithful in things like this, faithful in the little things, God speedily begins to answer your prayers. Speedily. In the midst of the pain, in the midst of my mom's suffering, we began to see answers to prayers that we had been praying for years. I mean, like that. And it was like, God, it, it, if this is what it takes, have grace and bless my mom with strength because now you're bringing about those things, Lord, that we have longed for in our hearts in relationship. That only God can do that. He's the only one that can take the heartache and make things right again. He's the only one that can take the brokenness and bind up the wounds. He's the only one. Because he's a good father. He, he's a loving father. He remembers our frame. He remembers. He pities us. Hallelujah. Uh, verse 8. <laughs> you shall bind them. The word of God. You shall bind the word of God as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Check this out. Check this out. You shall bind them. On, have you ever seen some of the Orthodox Jews that they have these... these um, Little boxes they put on their hand, and then they wrap a thong, a, a leather thong around them. And then, then they have these little boxes here on the forehead, right? And, and it has the Word of God in both of them. You ever seen those? I, I've shown you some pictures. You just forgot them. <laughs> no. But the Orthodox Jews, they do that, okay? And then, of course, you've heard the mezuzahs, right, where they put the Word of God, and you put, you put it on the doorpost. Anyway, Jew, Jewish people do that, okay? Because they take this verse literally. But I'm convinced that we were to take it spiritually first because words of God are spiritual. And what does it mean when it says that I, I, I bind them, I bind the word of God right here? It means that I do what God says. Everything I do, everything I work. Fathers, we need to see our kids. We need to have our kids see us doing the word of God. Living according to God's standards. They need to see us and, and, and know that we're not hypocrites. That we don't say one thing and do another. Our kids need to see that. So when he's talking about put it in your hand, he's saying do it. Work it out. And then right here, let, let me do what your word says. Let me think what your word says. Let me have your thoughts, not my thoughts, because your thoughts are higher than mine. And your ways are higher than mine. And then finally, this is about the door. What that means is, I'm, I'm convinced, it means, you know, you be careful what you let in your house. Be careful what you allow your children to do, to see, to hear. There's so much garbage out there. There's so much nonsense out there. There's, there's so much evil out there. And we are the protection for our kids. We are the ones who say, no, that's not going to happen. No, that boy, no, uh, I know his life, and, and so he's going to have no place in your life. Come on, moms. Dads, oh, I, I think I've told you this one before, but I'm going to tell it to you again. I love it. I love this illustration. A man was, was um, his, his daughter was going out on a day for the first time. And uh, so when he came to the door, you know, to pick her up, um, she said to him, you know, my dad says you need to talk to him before we go on this date. And so he uh, says, okay. So he went, where is he? He's over there. Let me go, go into the living room. So he w goes over there, and the, the, the father had a baseball bat. And on the baseball bat were all the rules that he had to follow if he was going to date his daughter. He says, first of all, uh, you're going to have her here by 10, not 10, 15, or 10, 30. You're going to be respectful to her. You're going to treat her like a young lady that she deserves to be. And he went on and on. He just going, you know, reading the. And uh, he says, now those are the rules before you take my daughter on this date. Do you understand them? Yes. Do you agree to them? Yes, sir. Okay. So they go out on the date. And then they come back. So on the second date, when he comes to the door, he says to his girlfriend, I, can I go talk to your dad first? He says, yeah. Uh, so he goes in there and he says, uh, sir, um, I told my dad 
um, about these rules. And he asked me if he could borrow your bat. <laughs> I love that. Setting, setting a standard. Setting a standard. I mean, it, we assume. Don't assume. Don't assume. We need to be clear in this day and age. We need to let them know, guys, this is what, what I'm going to allow. This is what I'm going to desire for you. This is what I believe God's best is for you. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for less. Hallelujah. So, oh my gosh, where am I? To intercede, to help. In um, verse uh, 20, uh, 29, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, let's jump 26. We read that. Oh, no, no, no. Let's go to 26. In Ephesians 5, 26, uh, we are to cleanse and sanctify our family by the washing of water by the word. This passage basically says, you know, you, you have to release that word into their lives. You have to teach them, t train them up in the way that they should go, that when they're old, they will not depart from it. And when we make this choice, I mean, to bring your kids to church, bring your children to church, you know, don't settle for them not coming to church. Bring them. And let the word, hey, I love these teachers back here. They, for years, no, for decades, these teachers have faithfully been taking care of your kids, loving them, showing them the word. Every day they, they learn something. The word of God is, is being written in their hearts and minds. The new covenant is coming to pass. But it's an effort that needs to be done because that is what's going to wash and cleanse our lives and the lives of our family. Hallelujah. And it, another passage says, uh, no one's ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Fathers, we are to love our kids. We are to cherish our kids. We are to be prophet. We're to be priests where we're, our children are, are feeling safe, protected, you know, cherished, directed. All of these things is, is what God wants us as fathers to do for our families to take care of them, to, to keep them from the evil one, to protect them, and to bless them with affection. To bless them with affection. To sustain them and nourish them. In essence, guys, and many of us have had fathers that didn't model this. Okay. We need to forgive them for not modeling this. Our dads just didn't know, you know. Or maybe our dads were absent. But it's, we need to forgive them and say, now, say, Lord, now you're showing me this. And by the way, I think I mentioned this already. Now you know. And since you know, now it's our choice. Do we do or not do? And I, and I believe good things for you all. I believe that you will take this to heart, and I believe you're going to run with it. And the blessing of God is going to overtake you. Hallelujah. And here the Bible is telling us we're to have this relationship with our children so that in this relationship, then we can be the king. We can be the one who gives the rules, sets the rules down, provides the guidelines that they're to follow. Without that, uh, I think it was Josh McDowell who would say that rules without relationship leads to rebellion. I think that's well said. Our kids are going to rebel if all we do is say, don't do this, don't do that, you better do this, you better do that. But there's no relationship, love, and, and affection there for them to feel safe in. Um, Jimmy Evans was, was talking about uh, an incident that he had with his little boy. And it, the incident was, was so powerful because it was one of these that we can all relate to. Him and his wife and their kids, they, when they were young, this many years ago, were taking a family picture, a family portrait. And there in the family portrait, their little boy was just behaving like like a little boy, yeah. And he was just, you know, messing around and disobedient, and, and he just wouldn't sit down, and he wouldn't settle down, and, and the photographer, you know, was pulling out his hair, and finally, <laughs> finally he says to his wife, uh, did you bring the spoon? Yes, I have it here. He says, we used to have a small wooden ladle with flowers on it that we used to correct our children with, okay? So he tells this, the photographer, sir, do you have a room? He said, yeah, you got a room right over there. He says, okay, come on, son. So he takes the little boy into the room, and he's got the spoon. 
He says, and I gave him two swats. He says, enough to hurt his feelings. He started to cry. And so he picked him up in his lap. He said, you know what you did wrong, son? <laughs> yes. Okay, so he hugged him. He loved on him. He prayed for him. He says, okay, now, let's go. Let's talk to the photographer. Went out to the photographer. I said, no, I need you to tell him I'm sorry. I disrespected you. And uh, so he did. And then they sat down, and the photographer says, Mr. Evans, in 35 years of doing this, no one's ever done this. And I want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you for doing this. He says, I was, I was priest to my son, and I was king to my son. I loved him. I served him. I taught him consequences for his actions. And I showed him the right thing to do. I think that's one of the most um, simple but clear, I think, expressions of how we as fathers are to love our kids the right way. We're to speak the word to them. We're to live the word. Okay. We are to intercede for them. We're going to pray for them. But at the same time, we provide boundaries. Okay. Boundaries are, are needed. And, and we, need to do, we need to be as faithful as we can in doing all three because we can't just go on one end and if we do just one, if, if all I'm doing is just, ay, pobrecito, mijo, you know, poor baby, he's just a boy. No, what, what happens is they're a mess later. They're a mess later. And we can't be too strict. We can't just be king, my way or the highway. There's got to be a balance. And the only way that happens is through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Reading the word and knowing and doing. Amen. Let's, let's read this one passage, guys, and then we'll be finished. It's, it's found in, the, God, in the, the Psalms, Psalm 103. Would you stand with me? In verse 8 of Psalm 103, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Thank God he's slow to anger. And he's abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. That's so true. For as, high, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And look at verse 13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. That, that's our model, guys. We're to, we're to remember, as it says in verse 14. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as the flower of the field. So he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And his place remembers it no more. But, everybody read this out loud with me. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, verse 18, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The word of God will not be broken. Take us now, uh, remove this uh, PowerPoint and take us to Ephesians 2.10, would you please? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And this is what I started with, and here's how I want to finish this this morning. Because, it, men, I, I, again, I don't want you to feel condemnation, but feel the conviction of the Lord. And if we're m lacking in one area, ask the Lord for help. Lord, where am I lacking and how do I fix it? And he will. But this passage says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's a choice we make to walk in them or not. And... Let me give you some real practical application to this. We don't even see these as good works, but they are. In the morning, you wake up. God bless you. And as you wake up, um, little Johnny has lost one of his tennis shoes. So, of course, we get after him, get upset and angry. Didn't I tell you? You're supposed to put him over here. But the good work is 
Get down on your knees and look under the bed because it's probably under the bed. I didn't have a chance to pack their lunch. Could you help me with this? Don't you realize I'm almost late to work? Or don't worry about it, honey. Let me pack their lunch today. Or better yet, here. Here's, here's money and you can buy lunch. That's the easier one for us. It's getting close to the, to the empty on the gas tank. Ah, but it's been a long day. I'm tired. I'll gas up tomorrow. Or in the back of our mind, we're thinking, or maybe she can fill up the tank. Now, the good work is, let me go ahead and take a few minutes and fill up the tank. It's not all prayer and supplication and no. It's how about we just do it? How about we serve? How about we take that good work that Jesus prepared before this world was founded and formed? And he says, you know, October 9th, 2022 at 8.30 in the morning, you know, they're going to be running late for school. And here's a chance for the fruit of the Spirit to come forth and for them to walk in this good work. And then it gets deeper. She hurt me. And I want to get her back. But God says I should forgive and release it. Those are the good works. God prepared for us before this, found, this world was founded. So he calls us to, to walk in him. And as my wife so eloquently says, well, now you know. So how do we do? We do it. We choose to do it. We live it out. The Holy Spirit helps. His word is present. Amen. I, I told you that at the start we'd, we'd come to this moment and we'd pray for you, intercede for you. Uh, anoint you with oil. I want to do that, okay? I want to open the altar for you to just come forward. Whatever it is that's on your heart, whatever it is that that God dealt with you about this verse, this Bible verses that we read, the Holy Spirit's talking to us all, okay? So how about we respond? Amen? But before we do that, just let me pray, and I want you to, especially the men, I'd like you to repeat this after me, if you would. Heavenly Father, I come to you, and I receive this word. Father, you know me. You know my faults. You know the times I've messed up. But I believe that if I confess my sin, you will forgive me. I confess my sins before you now. I ask your forgiveness, and I receive it. And now I choose to believe your word. I choose, and I decide to walk in faith. I choose to crucify this flesh and to live in Christ all the days of my life. I thank you now, Father. And I give you praise. Amen. Amen. Come. I'm going to open the altars. If you'd like prayer, Diana and I are going to be up here to pray for you, anoint you with oil. And then we're going to have communion and we'll be done. Everyone in here who believes in God and trusts in God and you acknowledge God as your Lord and your Savior, then it is very important that you say to God, Lord, I belong to you and you are my God. So right now, right now, I make myself available to all those good works that you prepared a long time ago. I'm present, I'm available. Open my eyes. Let not one of those good works be done by no one else because you prepared them for me. 
you acknowledge your place and make yourself ready for good works for the master. And believe me, it's work. It's not going to make it easy. It's work. We have people that come in here and clean the church as a good work. We offer ourselves for good works in the morning, early in the morning. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. And then we get up, we go to a real work, but the spiritual work of God are right there in front of us. And those are the ones that have a value for eternity. The ones that we go to work, that you get a paycheck, and that's all you get. The ones from him, from God the Father, are for eternity. Those are the real ones. Those are the ones that God keeps tabs on. And one day there will be a reckoning. One day there will be a, an accounting. Why do I say this? Because this message that he preached, now you know. You will give an account for, the, for those words. Now you know you're responsible for this precious family that he put in your path. Don't count on anybody else to do it. Now you know. And wives, our role is the most important role because we are to help, encourage, uplift the man of God, which is your husband's, your, to do and fulfill the good works. The good works is husband and wife for one. They're not just for one person. It is the two that become one. So if he doesn't do something, it's as if I didn't do it either. So together it is accomplished. And the greatest victory of all is, now you know, but the enemy knows that you know. And so quickly, he is out of the picture because you know. And someone presents to you and there's a need. I need to, my tire is flat. I'll go help you with it. The enemy doesn't know what to do with that, you know, he's like, that's a good work, and he has nothing to fight a good work with. Someone needs love and attention. He doesn't know what to do with it because you're just loving a person that no one else can love. Good works. They're works. You will have to work. Okay? But I encourage you. They were prepared a long time ago. Why? God knew we could do them. He equipped us. He gave us everything we need. And he put this love in our hearts. And it's got to come out. I am so glad to see all of you here. Because I see a lot of wonderful fruit that has been destined for everyone in here. Don't let it pass you by just because you're tired. Don't let it pass you by just because you want to watch a movie. Be real. Be honest. Yes, amen. I'm glad that Diana was able to be here. Uh, I, I told her something a while back. It was a dream that I had because uh, she's always been here, but she's always been back there. Okay. And in the dream, it was, you know, honey, I don't know, it was a strange, very brief dream you and I were preaching together. And uh, I didn't know when it was going to come to pass or how it was going to come to pass. But the Lord quickly opened that door. And um, we are at one. And God knows that. 
And so today, husbands, grab a hold of your wife. Don't let her go. Encourage her. Encourage your wife. Encourage the husband. Pray for your kids. I'm telling you, the target, yes, is you guys, but the target really is the kids. Don't open that door. Don't let the enemy come and steal, kill, or destroy. Amen? I'm going to pray for you all, uh, anoint you with oil, and then we're going to have communion.
Those that are going to help us with the elements, would you please come? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Church, thank you for your patience. Please come. Please come. Let's celebrate communion together. His blood has power still, by His wounds we shall be healed. This is For I receive from the Lord that which I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took blood, bread, and having given thanks, He broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the blood of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross. He was crucified. And we have been crucified with him. Therefore, we no longer live. Jesus Christ lives in us. And this life that we live in this body, we live by faith. Faith in Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. That's truth. That's facts. We receive that and faith in us is born anew and strengthened. We thank you and we give you praise. Church, eat the bread, drink the cup. Hallelujah. Would you just lift up your hands to the Lord for a moment? <clears throat> 